Hello, my name is Patrick Icaro and my brother Oliver from, we're from NorCal Strength Studio in Los Gatos, California. Today, we are going to be talking one of the uh, leading voices in uh, high intensity strength training. He is a medical doctor and author of Body by Science. Yay! <laughs> Dr. Doug McGuff. Welcome, Dr. Doug McGuff. For the Thanks, people, pleasure to be here. For the people that don't know, know you, uh, could you explain? Tell them uh, more about yourself. Yeah, sure. So um, I am a lifetime, lifetime participant and advocate of high-intensity strength training. I first started doing it in the um, late 1970s when I discovered Arthur Jones and Nautilus. Um, I came up from that point forward always performing high-intensity training, used it to train for a sport. Uh, in my youth that I was professional at, and that was bicycle motocross. Um, that sparked an interest in biology and physiology, which I studied in college, um, which further led to an interest in medicine. Uh, once I was in medical school, I found that my interest trended towards emergency care, uh, so I actually became an emergency physician, but all the while along maintained an interest in high-intensity training. Um, when I finally got into private practice in 1997, um, I got my own equipment and ultimately ended up opening my own shop to perform high-intensity personal training, and it's now in its 20th year. Wow, awesome. I don't know if you remember me. I spoke to you, gosh, it's been, a, it's been almost a year. I gave you a call. I had a, I had a yep. Parkinson's client. Do you remember that? Yep. He, yes. he was doing high-intensity strength training, and then I guess uh, I'd say about five, six weeks into it, he started stiffening up again. But before mm -hmm. that, he was perfectly fine. I gave you a call. He gave me advice. said, you know what, Pat? With uh, uh, Parkinson's client, you just make sure their speed, their, uh, speed is uh, – don't keep them under tension for 10 seconds. Just have them go with their regular, regular speed range of motion, but just making sure the turnarounds are nice and uh, – nice and uh, smooth I did that and after that he was fine came home came back to train me a few weeks later he said hey I can run now literally I mean he was to a point where no he was literally to a point where he was barely walking shifting his legs and I go yeah, yeah. I go yeah right Jerry he started running around me I go you know because I don't pay attention to that but the fact that the, the benefits of high intensity training, thanks to you, because I would have probably kept him on a 10 second protocol and I was just going, that's like, what am I doing yeah. wrong? It's a good thing I called you. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah, you bet. We have a, we have a few Parkinson's clients in our shop and it, it's amazing how, um, you know, everyone responds well to hit, but for some reason the people with Parkinson's really seem to take off on a steep curve. Uh, we had a client that on the first session, was shuffling so bad they couldn't bring their foot over the tiny little one inch threshold of the front door wow. without assistance and now is you know going on hikes and you know vacations and carrying our own luggage and things of that nature so it's it's pretty impressive now in your own uh, facility what other uh, medical condition you guys run into in terms of like on a Parkinson's, uh, a a l a l s, I think I believe. Do you guys have any yeah. other ones? That's we run the <laughs> we run the gamut. We have a little bit of everything. We have Parkinson's disease. We have some people with multiple sclerosis. Uh, we had a few clients with post polio syndrome. Um, lots of metabolic syndrome with type two diabetes over the years that have turned around and gone off meds. Oh, beautiful! You know your standard hypertension. I uh, have post-stroke clients, and then the whole post-rehab crowd from knee replacement, hip replacement, fill in the blank. So we, we generally don't shy away from anyone. Anyone that's willing to come and their doctor will let them, we will take care of them. Oh, could you talk more about the rehab crowd, doctor? Yeah, the rehab crowd, I don't actually do the rehab on. What we end up doing is sort of absorbing what's called the post-rehab crowd. So typically, um, someone has an orthopedic procedure done. As part of their post-operative care, they'll usually, their, their third-party payer insurance will usually provide them with post-operative physical therapy that 
generally will be slated for six or 12 weeks. And the amount of time that's determined for someone to have rehab is more predicated on how long the insurance will pay for it rather than how long someone needs to go. And a lot of times people feel like they've just kind of gotten their foot on the threshold at the time where physical therapy ends. And we are more than happy to kind of pick those patients up, continuing their specific conditioning for rehab, but wrapping that into a total conditioning package that most of them continue onward for the long term. Well, that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. So do they go to failure to a uh, majority of the rehab clients from the get-go, or do you guys kind of like ease them into it? Well, most of them do because we're receiving them kind of post-rehab. You know, we're not getting them where they're really, really vulnerable. So generally by the time we're receiving them from a physical therapy situation, um, they're pretty much ready to go at a pretty hard pace. Now, we'll always let the client define um, failure based on if they feel anything that is discomfort within a working joint mm -hmm. or anything that feels like pain or discomfort that is not exertional discomfort, like you experience with a normal workout. Um, but that's always the rule. Even someone that's not post-rehab, we have a little phrase that, you know, we'll just have them say to the trainer, it hurts. If those words come out of the client's mouth, everything stops and we assess what's going on. Um, so we have a little kind of a key, pay, key phrase or trigger so that we know when something sketchy is going on. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, another question, doctor. How do yeah. older clients benefit from HIT? And uh, the HIT scares a lot of our older and younger clients. And how do we as trainers encourage them to not be afraid of high-intensity strength training and engaging in it, especially to older clients? Okay, let me address the questions one by one. First, yeah. older clients, what do they have to gain? The, Ironically, um, they're the most fearful, but they are the ones that have the steepest curve of gain and improvement. And what they have to gain is their life back and their youth back. Um, there is a guy, uh, Simon Malov, in the LOV um, at the University of San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego, at the Buck Institute for Aging, did an amazing research on high-intensity strength training as it relates to aging and found a, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was in the realm of 200 specific genes that after 12 weeks of strength training reverted back to their normal youthful expression. Wow. So that's one thing. The other thing is just the functional ability that's gained by reclaiming your strength. Um, the elderly, because they have deteriorated so much in their strength, really immediately appreciate the change in their functional ability. And, um, you know, you'll hear it from two common things I'll hear. One is I was at the grocery store and I was picking up a 40-pound bag of dog food. And when I went to load my car, I grabbed it out of the car and put it in the trunk with one hand and went, holy moly, did I just do that? Making a realization that they had where they weren't able. Another one is we live close to a lake, we have a lot of clients that live on the lake here, and I will always hear, you know, I have to carry cans of gas down the walking trail to my boat, and normally I have to stop three times before I get there, and just last week I was like, I went all the way down, didn't stop once, didn't lose my breath, so all of a sudden activities of daily life they experience are like infinitely easier for them, and they're able to do things that they were not able to do. Um, this includes clients that come in with canes and walkers. Within six weeks, we have people completely discard their assistance device, no longer needing a walker, no longer needing a cane. And the way that you get them over the fears, you, you have to have them realize is that all we're asking of them is 100% of their current capability. Their current capability always limits how hard they can push. And initially, how hard they can push is not really that hard or threatful. But as long as they're giving a very good effort, 
the skeletal muscle's response is very predictable. It will just take off and go. It's just like clockwork. I mean, from one session to the next, they get stronger. And once they get a couple of sessions under their belt, they will realize, I'm not going to hurt myself. But at the outset, all you got to say is, your current strength level already limits the severity of your exertion so much that it's a built-in safety factor, and we will just build from there. And that's the same thing for all clients that are a little bit fearful of it. It's like, yeah, we're going to ask you to work hard, but you can't really work harder than you're capable of. And initially, um, your own intolerance to exertional discomfort and your current strength level will be a very um, safe kind of mitigating governor on the whole process. And then it builds from there as your capability grows. So it's sort of a built-in safety factor. They don't really have to worry about overexerting or harming themselves. Now, have you ever heard of anyone doing HIT? Uh, any practitioner, um, I'm sure you're familiar with CrossFit, and they have this issue called r r rhom rhomboid. Uh, no, no, you're thinking of uh, rhabdomyolysis. That's it, right there. And yeah. uh, have you heard of any person, people that actually does hit trainers that actually got their clients to a point where they're in that bad of a shape? No, I've never. You know, in terms of the type of high intensity training that you and I provide. That just never happens. Uh, so first, let's wheel back and we'll define what rhabdomyolysis is. So what rhabdomyolysis is, is actual um, structural damage to the muscle cell itself that causes that cell to rupture and burst open. Um, and two things kind of set the stage for that. One is high force exercise, mm. um, heat stress, and too high a volume of exercise. So most places where you see rhabdomyolysis are, you know, high school football camps that go crazy in the summer, um, CrossFit boxes with new trainees that are working in hot environments that's doing too high a volume with exercises that are ballistic and high force. So you get those three components together and you have a perfect suit for rhabdomyolysis. So what happens is, Muscle cell bursts open. The contents of the muscle cell spill out into the bloodstream where they circulate. And one of the most dangerous contents is um, myoglobin. So what myoglobin is is the oxygen-carrying molecule within the muscle that picks up oxygen from the red blood cells from the hemoglobin molecule that is in the red blood cells. So the blood cell circulates around the hemoglobin molecules carrying oxygen, the myoglobin molecule in the skeletal muscle actually has a little bit higher affinity for oxygen than the hemoglobin when the pH is a little bit lower like it is during exertion. So the oxygen gets passed from the bloodstream into the muscle cell. The problem with myoglobin is that it's a very big molecule. So when that circulates in your bloodstream, that very big molecule, as it passes through your kidney, gets trapped in the tubules of your kidney and can clog up the kidney and actually cause kidney failure. Oh. You combine that with the heat stress and the dehydration which occurs, and then you can actually have acute kidney failure from rhabdomyolysis. And that, that's where the big danger comes from. But the way that we practice it in a temperature-controlled environment, um, force-controlled exercise... The intensity is high, but the actual mechanical damage to the skeletal muscle does not anywhere approach a level where rhabdomyolysis could be triggered. Wow, thank you for that great explanation. Because I just read an article this morning about some personal trainer. He's being sued because of uh, that incident. Yeah, uh, yeah. What is the best way to explain to people the benefit of HIT who are used to doing high-volume training? Okay, so in a nutshell, is that it works, and it does so in a time-efficient fashion, and that's the biggest argument that I would make for that. Um, there are lots of people that are attached to a higher volume of training just simply because that's what they've learned and cannot conceive of anything else. 
Um, but eventually, particularly if someone moves on in their life, um, has a job, has children, gets busier, then out of necessity they will start to realize that they need to find a better way. Because it's either going to be a matter of giving it up because there's just not time to do it, or finding something that's more time efficient. And usually the, the need for the time efficiency is what will bring someone to high intensity training to at least give it a shot. But then once they at least give it a shot, all of a sudden they think, you know, I've kind of reached the limits of my potential. And then all of a sudden when they give it a shot and actually start doing less and allow for a little bit more recovery, they find that they have gone up to a new level that they really didn't expect that they would be able to go to. And once you've gotten someone there, then the rest is easy. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Just got to get them through the door, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and here's the thing is, um, you know, you don't have to go out and proselytize. Um, you just have to start with some clients and you can start with the clients that are ready to come to you and allow on the word now. If you take someone that's not ready to hear the message yet and you try to proselytize to them, it just drives them way further anyway. And the beauty of running a facility like you guys do is that you can be very happy with the fact that it is a niche market. We're not trying to appeal to everyone. We're trying to appeal to the more intelligent client that wants really good results and wants them in a time-efficient fashion. And um, there's plenty of those people out there. And there's plenty enough of those people out there where we don't have to go out and proselytize to try to win over other people. We just train the ones that come to us. And then when they mingle out in the world and, you know, they're at a dinner party or a business meeting, it's all like, man, you're looking good. What are you doing? Then the word of mouth takes care of it by itself. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I have a question from one of my clients, Patrick Ryan. Uh, says where there are, well, let me see. I don't want to promote any companies here without authorization, so let me ask this question without naming the company name. There is some new equipment out that provides a form of adaptive resistance so that a workout changes and puts more pressure on the negative than the positive. There's more to it than that, but that's the basic. The problem is that most of this equipment requires assistance of a personal trainer and the cost is prohibitive. For most gyms, facilities, impossible for individuals. Do you see a future with increased use of this kind of adaptive equipment? Are you familiar with any studies or trial, trials that demonstrate the effectiveness of this kind of assisted training? Basically, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're beating around the bush here. And I, <laughs> I know. I'm talking one of two things. And that would either be ARX, Adaptive Resistance Exercise, right. which is, um, or it could be the uh, equipment uh, that is um, promoted by Ellington Darden that has the tilting weight stack that makes the negative 40% heavier. Uh, yeah. But I believe that you're talking about ARX. ARX. And ARX is, it's very interesting equipment. So the resistance comes not from weight or gravity. But the resistance is actually generated by the client and the machine having what's called a brake motor. And basically the brake motor is an electric motor that moves at a fixed rate of speed. The client generates resistance by trying to exceed the rate of speed in the positive of the machine or um, reduce the rate of speed on the negative. So you're either trying to outrun the machine in the positive or stop the machine in the negative to generate resistance. And the resistance can essentially be infinite. In the early days of ARX, um, there was no um, computer feedback. So the problems were twofold. One was hard to grade your effort. And really, the way I used it when I tried it in the very early days, you'll find the... Uh, a video of me on the internet the getting time. totally decimated on uh, the crazy train is what it was called back then, was just to do a hyper protocol where you just did the hardest positive and the hardest negative you could until you were just like totally diminished and toast. Um, but now they have um, pressure plate feedback 
that can either give you a graphic display of your force output or sort of a speedometer play, uh, display of your force output with the instructor being able to set um, resistance goals for you. And it can be programmed to specific degrees of inroad, you know, 30%, 40%, what have you. So it's very useful equipment. Um, as far as I understand, it's not sold, it's only leased. And it is, um, for a lot of facilities, can be um, um, fairly expensive. I do think that it is um, a very useful tool. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily advocate it as a complete standalone thing, like your facility have that and only that. Um, but I think it is something that you can use to augment. Uh, a normal hip thing. I don't know of specific literature regarding the equipment, but you know anything that provides resistance in a manner that um, produces fatigue is going to result in a positive adaptation. That's well known. So um, to answer your question, I think it is good and viable equipment. Um, I don't know how widespread its usage will become, but I do know that there are a smattering of facilities all over the country that are using it and using it with good success. Right, right. Okay, so um, currently, what are your are you working on anything new right now? Books? Um, right now, I am kind of I'm trying to get started on a book um, that will focus on. Um, the endocrine function of skeletal muscle, the whole myokine issue. So myokines, um, it's probably within the past five to seven years have become a fairly big topic uh, in the research world. And myokines are basically chemical messengers released by skeletal muscle that have an endocrine effect. So what we're finding is that skeletal muscle has a beneficial endocrine effect through crosstalk with all the other tissues of the body. That includes nervous tissue, you know, cardiac tissue, skeletal muscle itself, you know, all the other organs of the body benefit from chemical messengers that are sent out by working skeletal muscle. And it has a very anti-inflammatory effect that mitigates against and protects against diseases of inflammation. And that's... Uh, I've collected a huge body of literature on that. Now I'm trying to massage it into um, a book that could be digestible by the lay public. Oh, you're just a you're just busy. You got your medical practice. <laughs> I'm busy, but that whole thing is going slowly. Like like every book that ever gets written, it's kind of a paragraph at a time. All right. Uh, diet. Are you still a proponent of paleo? Because I know that's. I read somewhere in one of your, I'm not sure if it was one of your blogs or one of your interviews that I know you guys specialize in high intensity strength training and you realize that some of your clients were doing the work but wasn't really getting the, 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 the uh, benefits of weight training because I guess they're still eating the same and then you told, you just pretty much, I don't know if you got everyone on paleo but you'd recommend paleo uh, diet to them and you saw a big amount of changes in their body. Yeah. So here's the background on that. When I first opened my shop, I actually attempted to sell some packages that were actually fat loss packages that incorporated diet and training and, you know, support meetings, all this stuff, and it was a miserable failure. Um, what I found is a lot of people that have become over fat have significant secondary gain from being over fat. And a lot of people that seek help from someone to lose fat um, are not necessarily being sincere with themselves or the person providing the service. Instead, what they're looking for is someone else to blame when they fail to lose weight. Um, so what I finally came to the realization was that I would be happy to guarantee fat loss for any client under the condition that I could lock them in a hotel room and slide the food under the door. <laughs> yeah, I'm to forget it. Um, but what I came to um, do was that if a client expressed an interest in fat loss, 
or express dissatisfaction with their body composition change, um, I just handed them a copy of Mark Sisson's Primal Blueprint or Rob Wolf's Paleo Solution and said, just look this over and see what you think and left it at that. And the people that took the book and read it, that the adoption of that dietary approach resulted in the best body composition changes we had seen in the entire tenure of the facility, and that's still true. Um, right now, when people ask me about diet, what I tell them is I believe in a diet that follows a straight path between you and the sun. So that means you can get in the sunlight and get the nutrients that come from sunlight, which include vitamin D3 um, and other vitamins and, and nutrients that we don't even know exist yet. Or the sun acts on plants and phytoplankton that through photosynthesis convert sunlight into energy. You can eat those. Then there's animals that eat those plants. And you can eat those. And there's animals that ate the animals that ate the plants, and you can eat those. And so on down the line. And as long as you stay on that straight pathway, your body knows what to do with it. Now, the macronutrient ratios on any given day could be high protein, moderate fat, no carb. It could be high carb, low protein, low fat. It could vary on a day-by-day -day basis, but as long as you're on that straight path between the sun, your body knows what to do with it and how to respond to the signals, and you will gravitate towards an ideal body composition. That's awesome. When you go off the pathway in the form of processing, then that's when it becomes harder for your body to process that, process that in terms of metabolites versus energy storage and the signaling becomes more and more confounded and difficult to adjust to. So the further you go off that straight line into higher and higher degrees of processing, then things start to fall apart. And that's just the most simple heuristic that I give people when they ask me about diet. All right, so we're coming down to the last few seconds. Uh, real quick, what is your current workout program, Dr. Doug? Um, my current is I do a two-way split that involves um, back, chest, and um, some leg movement, and then the other involves uh, shoulder, arm, and again, some sort of leg movement. Usually, it will be a leg press. Um, sometimes, it's leg extension, leg curl, calf raise, and I'll just alternate back and forth between the two. So, today, I will work out. I will do a compound row, a chest press, a pull down, a pull over, and a leg press. Oh, awesome. That takes about 12 minutes, your workout, the most? Yeah, about 12, 12, 14 minutes, depending on, you know, um, the pace of things. All right. That was so informative, Dr. Doug. Thank you so much. Maybe one day we'll do another interview. Thank you again. Okay, for awesome. people. For people who are interested in hearing more about Dr. Doug McGuff, can you tell them how to get a hold of you? Yep, just go to Dr. McGuff, that's D-R-M-C-G-U-F-F dot com. Everything else goes from there. Thank you, Dr. Doug. Take it awesome. easy. Awesome. All right, my pleasure.